heading south of the Mason-Dixon. This is the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. Here is your host, Brian McClanahan. Welcome back to the Week in Review at the Abbeville Institute. This is your host, Brian McClanahan, and this is episode 130, covering the week of July 15th through July 20th, 2018. Glad to have you back on the program, and this is a very special program because I have a live studio audience at this time. So we're actually at the uh, summer school, our 16th annual summer school, and and we'll do, be doing some special podcasts on that, special episodes during the week here. We'll have some interviews, so be looking out for those. But, of course, this particular podcast is going to be the usual thing. We're going to talk about the material that we had for the week that was July 15th to July 20th. Before we get started, just want to remind you to follow us on Twitter, at Abbeville Institute. You can like us on Facebook, at Abbeville Institute, and you can subscribe to our YouTube page, at Abbeville I-N-S-T. If you don't want to look for all those things, just go to our webpage, abbevilleinstitute.org. At the top of the page, you'll find all of our social media buttons. You can click on those. While you're there, give us an email address, and we'll give you a free ebook, Kirk Patrick Sales, Emancipation Hell, and you'll get our daily dose of Dixie Monday through Friday and our weekly email Saturday or Sunday with a link to this podcast. Also remember that the Abbeville Institute exists on your generous contributions alone. So if you like what we do, if you like the podcast, if you like our website, if you like our programs, please consider giving a tax-deductible contribution to the Abbeville Institute and help us continue to explore what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition. You can do that on our website as well. At the top of the page, you'll see a tab that says support. Under that, you'll have donor options, and you'll have all of the different ways you can contribute, as little as $3 a month if you're a student, or $5 a month if you're not, or $25 a year if you're a student, or $50 a year if you're not. And we have a great new donor interface, so go on out there and check that out. Also remember that you can get the Abbeville Institute on the go with our web application. I'm just going out to your uh, favorite store, iTunes, Google Play, wherever you use, and you can get the Abbeville Institute app, and you can have this podcast and all of our lectures on the go. It's a great way to do it. And, of course, you can get all of your Abbeville Institute apparel. It's embroidered apparel. You can go to the uh, Abbeville Institute webpage again at the top of the page where it says support. Click on that. And you'll see a, 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 a option that says shop, and that'll take you out to our store. You can get your Abbeville Institute hat or T-shirt or polo shirt, towels, a lot of great stuff. So go on out and check that out. Okay. All that said, let's talk about the week that was at the Institute. And this is actually kind of fun because I'm doing this on a Monday. We didn't got to the Friday material yet. So all the people that are here are going to hear what's going to be on the website before it's even there. Um, so I want to start actually with a piece that we ran on Tuesday and the piece – on uh, Thursday, uh, and uh, they're in a similar theme, though not necessarily a similar topic, and that theme is the problem of neoconservatism and the South. What do I mean by that? Because this is a, this is a big issue. You know, when, you have, when you look at the South and you look at exploring what is true and valuable in the Southern tradition, and people think the South is conservative, right? So we have this conservative South, but today you have the Republican Party. And that is really the problem. It's the Republican Party. Because the Republican Party has never been the friend of the South. And I know a lot of people say, well, what do you mean by that? The Republican Party, everybody in the South is Republican. Well, this is true because I think they've all been duped into believing that that's what's supposed to be for the South. But when you look at the two pieces we have for this week um, on this particular topic, one, we'll start with uh, a book review by Donnie Kennedy, and it's a review of Sammy Mitchum's, or I'm sorry, Sandy Mitchum's book, uh, Vicksburg. And um, Sandy Mitchum has actually written for the website before, and uh, this is a, a great book. Uh, he wrote a book, um, I believe, on, uh, on Nathan Bedford Forrest as well. And uh, this particular book uh, is on the Battle of Vicksburg. And the Wall Street Journal reviewed the book uh, not long ago. And um, the... You would think the Wall Street Journal would be fairly sympathetic with the South, right? It's a conservative newspaper. You would think that they would support what the South does and the Southern tradition. You think conservatives support these kind of things. But, of course, that's not going to be the case. And, and uh, Donnie Kennedy points this out. So uh, he talks about how these newspapers, this newspaper in particular, was very critical of Mitchum's positions in the books, in this particular book, because he had the audacity to be pro-Southern. And that's the real problem they have with it. They're fine with the scholarship in the book. They do make a few snide comments about how he doesn't have enough footnotes or uh, these type of things. But 
for the most part, the critique of the book is that it is too pro-Southern, that Sandy Mitchum is too pro-Southern. And how can you be that in today's day and time? Right? How can you be that when you have Dinesh D'Souza stand up and say that the Democrats, who are all Southerners, are all the bad guys, what they've done, what the neoconservatives have done is produce an us-versus-them mentality even in, quote-unquote, conservatism. And you have what is often called conservative ink. It's this uh, a, a dominant newspaper, television strand of conservatism that seems to discount everything the South does. And, uh, and I just mentioned something about D'Souza. I've talked about him this, on this uh, podcast before a couple of times. But uh, I actually watched a lecture by him the other day, and he stood up and said that uh, this is true. No Republicans ever owned slaves. And that's funny because the largest slave owner in Delaware in 1861 was a Republican. So I, don't know, I guess he missed that one. But, uh, and he, he gets into this, uh, this, this position where the Republican Party are the noble good guys and the uh, Democrats in the South are the evil, horned-headed bad guys. And, of course, where have you heard that before? Well, it's all over the popular media from that particular time period. And that is carried right into the 21st century. In fact, there's a, there's a rejuvenation of this particular idea. And so conservatives in the South really don't have a home. And this is what, what Donnie Kennedy is getting into here. These people should be on our side. I had a friend of mine tell me the other day that what, what's really happening right now is that you have the left, which is, I mean, we all know those people are, are just, a little, just a little crazy. And then you have the other side where we're really still battling out what this America that we have is all about. You have the Hamiltonians and you still have the Jeffersonians in that conservative side. Unfortunately, the Jeffersonians are losing. Um, and that's why I do what I do with this podcast and why we have the Abbey Bill Institute and the other things that I do. It's, it's to try to ensure that at least there's some voice out there, and of course there are others, but there's something out there and, uh, that, that can actually support this other side. So when you have books come out like Sandy Mitchum's, and I would highly recommend you get it, his book on Vicksburg, and it's published by Regnery History, which is great. I mean, Regnery History is a great conservative publisher. They've published five of my books, so uh, I, I think it's wonderful. They, they've also produced some stuff on the other side. They produced a, a book by a guy named Bone Kemper that's pretty awful uh, when it comes to uh, you know, the, the war itself, and um, uh, he's very critical of the South. I actually had a guy tell me one time that they don't – it's one of these uh, neoconservatives that uh, – I mean, they're, they're right on a lot of issues. But he told me one time that uh, the reason that they're so critical of the South is because they love the South, you see. They're, they're, they want to save the South from itself. You see, the South – if it wasn't for Southerners, the South would be great. That's the whole idea. I mean, Southerners need to be saved from their own stupidity. And so Reconstruction saved us from ourselves. This is a book about Reconstruction. Saved us from ourselves because we're too stupid to do it ourselves. We have to have these noble people come in and do it for us. And so when you look at the piece on, on Thursday, Bushwhacking the Bill of Rights, and it's a wonderful title. It's actually written by Ludwell Johnson. This piece was actually uh, it was written in um, 2002. So it's, uh, it's a few years old, but it goes into George W. Bush's suspension of habeas corpus. And this is something that people overlook. Of course, it's been suspended by Barack Obama. I'm pretty sure it's still suspended. I mean, this was 2012. We had the National Defense Authorization Act, which suspended habeas corpus. And, uh, but it was done before that. And, of course, all under the guise of fighting terrorism. And Ludwell Johnson was a great old Southern historian. If you've never read anything by Ludwell Johnson, I'd highly recommend it. His book, North Against South, is the, the top book on the war in a concise format. 1848 to, takes it through Reconstruction, so it's a, it's a wonderful book. If you don't have it, I highly recommend you get it. Uh, it's actually what I use in, in, for the textbook in, in my course on, on, the, uh, on the war at McClanahan Academy. But it's, it's a wonderful book, and of course, Johnson gets into this idea. Here you have George W. Bush, a conservative. Suspending habeas corpus. All under the, I mean, people applauded. Yay, George W. Bush, he's one of our guys conservative. What Johnson points out is that this isn't conservative. This isn't, this isn't uh, consistent with the Constitution. What they're doing is illegal. 
And he uses the Ex parte Milligan case of 1866 as an example. If you're not familiar with Ex parte Milligan, essentially what happened was uh, you had habeas corpus suspended in the North during the war. And uh, what that means, of course, is produce the body. If you're not familiar, it's one of the few civil liberties that's actually in the Constitution itself before the Bill of Rights. So it's, it's in there. And the only entity that can suspend habeas corpus is the Congress. And I hear one of the critiques of, of course, the war, and when you start bringing this up, people will say, well, yeah, but what about the South? They suspended habeas corpus, too. How can you? Well, they did, uh, but the Congress in the South did it, and then they pursued the policy. In the North, Lincoln did it, and then the Congress followed suit a couple of years later. Right, so it was exactly backwards of what they needed to do legally. And, of course, you had Lincoln's attorney general saying, well, this is perfectly consistent legally. And I remember when I was writing my dissertation on James Byard, and he, he, he was in the Senate at the time, he, he laughed at the attorney general and said, there is no attorney worth his salt that would ever realistically support this position. But yet this is exactly what the Lincoln administration has done. And so what Johnson has done is attach Bush to Lincoln. And, of course, they're fine with that. When you have Karl Rove saying that the South, the Confederacy, is the enemy, these are the terms they use, and that uh, you had the good guys and the bad guys. This is perfectly consistent with their ideology, the, the Lincolnians. But Johnson says, you know, what we're doing here is going back to the time of the war. We're going back to, to Lincoln. We're doing something that shouldn't have been done then. And the Supreme Court actually knocked down. And the funny thing is about that, when you look at the Chief Justice at the time, this is Salmon P. Chase. Salmon P. Chase was part of Lincoln's cabinet at one point. Uh, and yet, here he is, Chief Justice of the Supreme Court, and he says, you know what, you can't do that. You, you can't suspend habeas corpus when the civil courts are open. Of course, Tawney said that as well, and ex parte Merriman. But here we have another case, ex parte Milligan, where they do the exact same thing. And so what did the Congress do, the Republican-controlled Congress? They just removed the court's jurisdiction over that. Well, you know what, you just can't hear these cases anymore. They also, when Andrew Johnson became president, uh, made it to where he couldn't appoint any Supreme Court justices. That's the dirty little secret in Washington, D.C., that if the Congress really wanted to rein in the federal court system, they could do it all day long. They could, they could make it to where the uh, court had very limited jurisdiction. They could have where you only have one justice on the bench. They could do anything they want with the Supreme Court, yet they don't because it's a way to raise money, you see. They can go out and complain about the court, and they can go to Heritage Foundation and get them to give them some money. And, uh, you know, we're going to get in the courts. I remember John McCain standing up and when uh, the uh, Obamacare decision was, uh, the, the, uh, was pending. We're going to fight this thing in the courts. Well, what happens if, they, if you lose there? Well, I don't know because they don't have an answer. I guess vote better, right? We'll get some more justices on there. We'll, we'll, we'll believe in Trump putting on good uh, – appointing good justices, and we'll overturn the thing that way maybe. Who knows? Uh, but this is, this is the modern era, and this is the problem with modern American politics, and Johnson's pointing that out. We have executive tyranny. We have government of, by the executive branch, for the executive branch. We really don't have real checks and balances anymore. And all he's saying is that what Bush has done is going back to this very dangerous time in 1866 when we had an out-of-control general government a rump parliament, essentially, a rump Congress where they can do whatever they want. And the Supreme Court, when they tried to do something, was just going to be emasculated by the Congress. So it's important to know your history when it comes to Reconstruction and, of course, the uh, Lincoln administration. Because the Republicans, as I said, are the enemies. They always have been the enemies of the South. It's not changed. And I know people, you know, I, when I did a one of my own shows on that, I talked about how the Republican Party hasn't changed since 1861. It really hasn't, 1854. And people were very upset about hearing that because they want to be a good Republican. And, uh, but it hasn't. I know that a lot of Southerners believe in the Republican Party, and maybe on the local level you can see some differences. But um, the party itself is still, as you know, Clyde Wilson and others have called it, it's still the stupid party. It always will be. So what we really need in the South is something else. Uh, but um, it's um, maybe a lost cause at this point to try to save the uh, – that's the real lost cause, to try to save the Republican Party. 
All right, so all that said about the neoconservatives, there, this, this is actually part of it, too, because the Republican Party in some ways is imperialism. It's, it's cultural imperialism. It's political imperialism. Of course, you've got imperialism itself and, and uh, looking at acquiring overseas uh, territories and colonies, but it's that cultural and political imperialism that the South is still suffering from that uh, you know, we're, we're have a Stockholm syndrome. We can't get around this. And the two, piece, two pieces actually go along quite nicely with that this week as well, the piece that we ran on Friday and the piece on Monday, in fact. So let me start with a piece on Monday. It's actually about Nathan Bedford Forrest. It's written by Benjamin Alexander, who's um, – uh, this piece was actually published in 1987. Uh, so it's, it's an older piece, uh, but it's, it's – it, most people haven't read it. So it's, it's a wonderful little essay on Forrest and Southern folkways. And Alexander actually had the, the uh, honor – of stuttering, uh, studying, studying, uh, stuttering, studying with uh, with Lytle at uh, at Vanderbilt, and so of course um, uh, Lytle's Bedford Forrest and his Critter Company is one of the best biographies ever written on Forrest. And uh, what he does in this essay, which I find fascinating, is attach the plain folk of the old South, this idea of Frank Owlsley, the, the plain folk of the old South, and gets it to Forrest. He connects the dots there. Forrest was an enigma in some ways to some members of the uh, Southern society because he wasn't a West Pointer. He wasn't a guy that uh, went to uh, the uh, went to West Point and moved up through the, through the professional military ranks. Here's a guy that joined as a private and worked his way up because of folkways, because this is how it worked where Forrest was from. And so that, in, in so many ways, is indicative of a part of Southern culture that people miss. There is the great old Virginia society. There's the Lees and, of course, Davis being from that, uh, you know, uh, married into a, uh, a, a high society as well. But then there's people like Forrest, more of these self-made men kind of idea. Uh, he, he's uh, uh, someone that uh, doesn't necessarily fit. He's a little bit crude, a little bit rough around the edges. Uh, he doesn't fit with someone like Robert E. Lee or maybe even Jefferson Davis. And, of course, uh, that was a rub at times. And Forrest bristled at the treatment he received during the war because he was seen as kind of this country bumpkin. Now, a great general. In fact, you could make a case perhaps uh, you know, maybe the best general of the war uh, outside of uh, maybe Jackson. But um, you look at these two guys, and they were, they were hammers, and Forrest was never used properly, according to, uh, according to Lytle, according to Alexander. He was never used properly in the war, but, and the reason being is because there was kind of this snobbery. Now, that's an interesting thesis, um, but I think it's fun to point out how important that plain folk of the old South was and how important that plain folk still is to the South today. Um, there, there's, there's always a discussion of the people you need and, and when you have a political movement uh, one of the things that I think Donald Trump was able to tap into, whether you like Trump or not, uh, tap into, is this, the people, right? He, he was someone that was able to get people to support him because they believed in something, and it was just the people that might give him five bucks or 25 bucks. Uh, he, of course, had large donors. He didn't need it. He could, he could do it himself. But I think that was the allure of Trump. He made people feel like they mattered, just the guy out there with the pickup truck. And I remember... Um, <laughs> Years ago, uh, uh, what was that guy? Since I have an audience, I can't remember his name. Uh, the uh, the guy uh, that said he wanted to be the guy that can, he was the Democrat wanted to be the Confederate, Confederate flag guy on the pickup truck. Uh, he was running, um, and he had the very famous yeah. And he uh, who was who was that guy? Um, Y'all remember? Anyways, I can't remember his. I'm sorry. Uh, he was running for president and a real left wing guy. Uh, Howard Dean. Howard Dean. Here he is. Howard Dean. Yeah. And uh, he wanted to be the guy of the, of the Confederate flag. And he took a lot of heat for this. How can you say, Howard Dean, you want to be the guy of the Confederate flag on the pickup truck? Well, Tr Trump said, I'll be the guy of the Confederate flag on the pickup truck. I'll be that guy. I'll take those people. So he's tapping into these, to these plain folk, these southern folkways. He's getting into that. And that's why people gravitated to Trump, working class people, because he made them feel like they mattered. Forrest made people feel like they mattered. And all over the South. I mean, this was somebody that they could relate to. This was one of them. Uh, of course, a, a wealthy planter eventually, but still one of them. And so it, just by tearing down Forrest, you're tearing down your, its, its cultural and political imperialism on the South. You can't admire Forrest. 
You can't admire that guy because of A, B, or C, or X, Y, or Z. These bad things we come up with, you can't admire, admire him because of that. So they're saying who we can have as heroes and who we can't have as heroes. Um, and all traditions have good and bad. I mean, I've said that several times on this show. All traditions have good and bad. So it's, it's not to say that you, you can take Forrest and he's great, he's perfect. Nobody ever was. We know that. Uh, but there are certainly things to admire about Forrest, and there's a reason why he was, a, for a long period of time, considered to be one of the great Southern heroes. And the reason we ran this piece on Monday is because Forrest's birthday, of course, was the 13th, so last Friday. We had something going on, uh, something else that week. So, uh, But we, this is in honor of his, of his birthday. Um, and it, it's a wonderful little assessment, and I think a, a very interesting thesis. Well worth your, worth your time to read it. And then the piece on Friday ties into that, too. This is another older piece, 1990. It's written by Laurie Hibbett. And the title of the piece is The Southron's Burden. Now, that term, S-O-U-T-H-R-O-N, Southron. Uh, that was a way to say a Southerner for a time. It's, it's a use of language, and language matters. And, and uh, we're talking about this in this summer school. We just had a, a wonderful uh, presentation on language and how uh, we've had one on gospel and how uh, the, the, the uh, gospel music um, is not what it used to be because of the language and because of the traditions. It's being forgotten. Or you have the Cajun music that's being forgotten. Language matters. And how Southerners use language matters. Your accent matters. Um, I, when I was in um, eighth grade, I had a teacher. Uh, she was from Alabama. I, didn't, I, didn't, I went to school in, in, in Delaware. So she was from Alabama. My favorite teacher of all time, all the way through uh, elementary school, middle school, or what they called at that time, junior high school and high school. Uh, and she was from Alabama. Her name is Betty Mannion. And she told me, uh, first of all, the coolest thing about her was that we read Southern literary figures in eighth grade. And we, I didn't know at the time, but she was doing this on her own just to, to try to infuse some things. And she, not just that, she loved Washington Irving. And if anybody knows anything about Washington Irving, Washington Irving hated Yankees. He hated them with a passion. In fact, if you read uh, The Legend of Sleepy Hollow, Ichabod Crane is the quintessential Yankee. That's what he is. And this is why the native New Yorkers are trying to run him out of town. So uh, she had us read all this stuff, but I remember she was telling me that when, when she was uh, coming up through school, she had to lose her southern accent. She had to get rid of it because she thought that that was the thing you had to do to get a job. She couldn't sound like she was from Alabama. And she actually uh, it taught her children that way, too, because they had, they had the accent. They would go to school, and she would say, I'd have to try to reteach them not to have that accent because she didn't think that having that accent would allow them to get anywhere. They, w they, would be, they would be stigmatized because of it. Well, you're a country bumpkin from the South. You can't have that accent. And um, that's an, it's, that stuck with me. All these years it stuck with me, and I didn't think anything about it when I was 13 years old. Okay, that's a fun story. Uh, on to other things. But now that I've gotten older, you know, and, and I look back at it and all the things that I've done, I think about that, and this piece speaks to that because... It talks about how in the 1970s, for example, uh, she brings up uh, Gerald Ford and the term forthcoming and how Ford actually changed the term forthcoming. Or not just that, uh, how people, instead of saying, uh, you know, Kerry Roberts and I went to the store or, uh, you know, so-and-so and me, they change it to Kerry Roberts and myself. What the heck does that mean, myself? But this is cultural imperialism. And there's a funny story at the end of this piece that I, I laughed at it when I read it. Um, she was talking about how she was working in a, in a, a, a hotel. And um, she was there, and um, this man from Pennsylvania uh, was in the hotel. And I'm, so I'm going to read um, part of this because it's just so funny. Uh, she says, quote, it must be said here that the northern does not sometimes appear raucous. It is probably his accent, deriving as it often does from northern European language. It seems to us harsh. It shrivels our self-assurance. We feel ourselves once more be being captured at Fort Donelson and shipped to Fort Warren prison in Boston Harbor. 
to languish with Mr. Lincoln's civilian prisoners from Baltimore held there without habeas corpus for the crime of expressing sympathy for the South. So what happens here is this Pennsylvania um, Pennsylvanian has uh, confronted her about prisons. And so this Pennsylvanian says, what about Andersonville? A Pennsylvania professor asked me one day out of the blue. I was serving as desk clerk in the motel where he was a guest. South baiting is an unrestricted sport for the northern tourist. What about it, I asked. You southerners have a lot of shrines to your side of the war, he said, but I notice you don't bring up Andersonville. Don't be too hard on Mr. Lincoln, I said. Mr. Lincoln, he shouted. Do all Yankees shout? Of course not. It only sounds that way because of the <laughs> ring of authority. Mr. Lincoln, I said, we petitioned him officially to exchange those dying prisoners, the, the rate being three of theirs to one of ours. He wouldn't take them. Then we pled to be allowed to send them with escort on boxcars back to federal lines. Again, he refused them. They were sick, starving, no longer useful as soldiers. They would have been an added drain to waging his war. We, on the other hand, were feeding them as well as we could feed ourselves. Rats were being eaten at Vicksburg. Jefferson Davis himself was emaciated. Look at his pictures, skin and bones. I never saw a fat man in my grandfather's generation, the generation after the war. I give you my word. The PA prof turned away without batting an eye. I presume he had seen the play about Andersonville and did not believe a word I said. Come on, you guys, he said. That's another thing she brings up, you guys. Uh, you guys, even if it's women. Come on, you guys, he said to his wife, two young daughters, and one little boy who um, he had previously referred to as David, the northern pronunciation of David. Uh, let's get the show on the road. That suited me fine. After he had the guys out on the sidewalk, he had a second thought. He turned around and came back inside. He walked up to my desk. Question, he stated. Yankees talk like that. I would have said, sir, may I take a little more of your time to ask just one more question, if you don't mind? The Southerner feels that a certain amount of decent clothing softens a naked question. Why are you Southerners so defensive, he asked. That was his question. I knew my answer was not in a script, but I was honor-bound to tell the truth. Because you Yankees are so offensive, I said. Once I said it, I regretted having said it. I had violated the Southern code of courtesy. That is a Southern's burden. We must smile and smile when the jokes and jibes roll over us. To take offense is to add substance to the charge of defensiveness or even paranoia. That most of us live peacefully with this tension is to our everlasting credit. After all, we know in the depths of our Bible Belt belie believing the truth of the old Christian motto, to whom much is given, much is required. And so she gets into this idea of language here. You know, the, first of all, she's picking on the way he says David and question and all these things. And, but it's, it's true. I mean, we're, the South is dealing with this cultural imperialism in a way that no other people in the United States have to deal with. Uh, long standing. Uh, and it doesn't matter, uh, you know, where you're from in the South. This is the case. And so I love the piece for that, and it's one that should be read. It, it's, the, the, uh, Miss Hibbett has a, a gift for writing. It's a, it's a fun little piece to read. And then we, we wrap up this, this, uh, this episode with a piece by Mel Bradford, The Americanization of James I. Riedel. And if you don't know who James I. Riedel is, he's uh, one of the founding generation from North Carolina, one of the most important members of the founding generation, but one of these forgotten founders, and uh, I. Riedel later served on the United States Supreme Court. In fact, one of the best justices they ever had uh, because he was actually an originalist. They don't have those anymore. I know that uh, everyone keeps saying that uh, these Trump appointees are all originalists. Um, I don't know about that. Uh, but uh, I. Riedel uh, was a guy, of course, supported the, uh, the American War for Independence. He was a staunch Southerner, um, but... Um, the thing I like, uh, of course, he was born in England, so he wasn't even born uh, in, the, uh, in the American colonies. Uh, he's actually born in a very interesting place. He was born in a place, and I'm going to ask you all how to pronounce this. It's spelled L-E-W-E-S. How do you pronounce that word? L-E-W-E-S. E-S. Is it Lewis or Lewis? Uh, it depends on who you ask. I actually grew up in Delaware, and it was actually in 
He grew up in, he was born in Sussex County, England. I grew up in Lewis, Sussex County, Delaware. Okay, it's on the, if you look at the state of Delaware, it has a little point comes up. That's where Lewis is. And uh, there's a funny joke running around in the town there because the, the tourists come in all the time and they don't, they call it Lou's. And so we had, we had an ice cream store in town, a, a Dairy Queen. And uh, there was a joke going around. They would say, um, so uh, the, the, the tourists would come up and they would ask the person behind the, at the counter saying, okay, my friend and I are having a conversation about this and we need you to solve the issue. I want you just to speak very slowly. Tell me exactly how to say it. Where are we right now? And the person behind the counter says, Dairy Queen. Uh, so, <laughs> uh, of course, a lot of the tourists in that area are from New York and Pennsylvania. and, and Anyways. Uh, so the thing I like about Iredell is that he, he, when you look at how he argued for ratification, it was ratification on the merits of the Constitution as it stood at the time, which meant that the, the general government only had the powers delegated or granted, here and granted, as Article One says, and it had nothing else. And the states had everything else. That's how everyone understood the Constitution in 1788, including Iredell. Uh, but that's not the way that people explain the Constitution. In fact, if you say... And people say, well, golly, how can you support secession? Because that's not in the Constitution. It doesn't say the states can secede. Well, of course it doesn't because it doesn't need to. Uh, that's, it's not denied by Article One, Section 10. Well, then you believe in implied powers, don't you? No, uh, not for the general government, for the state governments. And this is exactly how the nationalists, even people like James Wilson, uh, all those who were friends of the Constitution, this is exactly what they said would happen. In fact, James Wilson of Pennsylvania made the most important speech uh, in favor of ratification just a couple of weeks after the Constitution was written. It was called the State House Yard Speech, and everyone read it. And he said that exact same thing. Look, if it doesn't say if the general government can do it, they can't do it. If, and as far as the states, if it doesn't say they can't do it, they can do it. So that means if it doesn't say a state can't secede, it can secede. That was understood until 1860 and 1861, north and south, it was understood. And I. Riddell was one of the few dissenting voices in the Chisholm v. Georgia decision, which led to the 11th Amendment. Uh, he didn't think that the, the, the uh, Congress had the power to abridge the sovereignty of the states and eventually get the 11th Amendment, which gives us state sovereign immunity, where you can't. So all of these things work together. Of course, that is uh, when it's, that piece may be a little oddball, but um, the fact is that that view of the Constitution, the neoconservatives are against it. So when I can say I can wrap all this together, the neoconservatives are against that position. The people that support the Wall Street Journal or George W. Bush, they're against that. They're against James Iredell. They're against his position on that, and that's cultural and political imperialism, no worse than language, and perhaps just as potent, maybe even more potent. So I hope you enjoyed this week and review at the Abbey Institute. Until next time, good day.